there's just something about getting away to the Smoky Mountains. Step out on a hiking trail, zoom across a zip line, splash at water parks, shop till you drop, and say hello to the statue of our hometown hero, Dolly Parton. Discover the thrill of visiting the Smoky Mountains and reconnect with those you love the most in Sevierville, Tennessee. Learn more at visitsevierville.com. That's visit, S-E-V-I-E-R-V-I-L-L-E dot com. If you've ever been a renter, you know it's stressful to find a place with everything you love and nothing you don't. But did you know Zillow does rentals? It makes the search so easy. They have filters for pretty much everything, so you can find that place that's in your budget, but also isn't a shoebox. Or a place that's close to your parents, but far enough they have to call first. Plus, it's easy to apply, request tours, and pay rent in the app. Head to ZillowRentals.com and find your sweet spot. Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson, here on the Maroon Friday edition of The Yard. Hope things are well with you wherever you are today. Hope it's payday. For you, how about that? It is Friday. For you bi-weekly and weekly wage earners, it could be a payday. So maybe you get out and go get some grub, have some fun, hit a club, take your family out to eat, whatever. Whatever you do when you're not with me, I hope you enjoy it to the fullest. It is the weekend, and we don't have any college baseball to watch. We don't have any college football to watch. So you might as well get out and do something really cool. You know, I tell you, I was uh, considering heading back down to Howlin' Mow's tonight to go see the John Karabi show. For those of you who don't know, John Karabi was the singer of Motley Crue when uh, they recorded the self-titled album during Vince Neal's hiatus after he was dismissed from the band. I really like John Karabi. John Karabi originally had a band called The Scream, and I love that album. It's difficult to find now. It used to be on Apple Music. I guess they lost their licensing, but... Uh, couple videos out there bouncing around on YouTube. You can find the album in its entirety. It is an absolute banger from start to finish. If you still buy hard copy CDs, let me encourage you to go to Amazon today and order it. You will thank me later. But John left the scream, joined Motley Crue. I think the self-titled album is phenomenal. I know many of you don't. You say, well, it's not Motley without Vince. I think musically, it's the best Motley Crue album. I think the song... Uh, Till Death Do Us Part is uh, phenomenal. Hooligans Holiday, Living in the Know. There's just a bunch of great songs on that album. So I really wanted to get down there and meet John. He did some uh, work with Union. I have a Scream t-shirt. I have a collection of John Karabi picks. Just couldn't pull it together. Had uh, dinner with a good friend. And uh, that's always time well spent. You know it is. And so I uh, went over and uh, had a steak and uh, felt good about life. Talked about the College World Series for a couple of hours, and now I'm here with you. A lot to talk about. The landscape in college athletics may be changing. I'm going to break a lot of that down for you today. I'll be honest with you, my opinion on this matter has changed in the last 24 hours. So we'll get into some of that. I'll tell you what I think is going to happen, what needs to happen, how it benefits Mississippi State, and how it might be detrimental in some aspects to Mississippi State. I'll share that with you. I want to remind you, too, that there's a lot going on with baseball. There are some transfers. We're going to talk about that later in the show. But also, too, Duty Noble Field is going to get a bit of a facelift in the offseason. The ribbon boards that were part of the renderings, that's going to be installed, I understand, uh, January, February. So we're a few months away. But we'll get through the calendar year. You'll see that happen. Of course, Mississippi State also making a huge financial commitment uh, to revamping the weight room for baseball. That's a good thing, too. To the victor, go the spoils. I I tell you, I suspect there are a lot of people with resources that are willing to write that check today that maybe weren't a month ago. And I don't mean they're not true maroon. It's just now that we've pushed through, I think people are more willing to make a financial commitment to college baseball because they understand, you know what, we finally got over the hump. A lot of discussions, too, about what the draft means to Mississippi State. We actually came out of this thing pretty good. You're losing Houston Harding. That's really the only real surprise, the only real disappointment, I guess, in, in, in most respects. I mean, you know, we, we expected, you know, James Wood, Maddox Bruns. Uh, we expected those guys to go, Jordan McCants. And so, you know, you, you can't lose what you never had. But Houston Harding was a guy, obviously, that was very instrumental in Mississippi State's postseason run. And you'd like to have seen him come back. You know, that's the thing that I think about, too, with a 40-round draft next year. 
probably going to sign for peanuts now, probably would have signed for peanuts next year. But by signing now, you remove every possibility of potentially moving up in the draft to perhaps uh, boosting your professional stock. And so you hate to see it, but at the end of the day, you know, we're looking at it from a selfish vantage point. We want what's best for Mississippi State. That may not necessarily align with what's best for Houston Harding. He Only he can make that decision. But we are very grateful to Houston Harding for his contributions to Mississippi State baseball. He walks away a national champion. That's a pretty cool story, right? You guys are well aware, and if, if you didn't know, I wrote an article we were in Omaha. If you didn't get a chance to read it, ESPN basically took everything that I wrote in that article and passed it off as their own information uh, during the broadcast. And so, you know, thanks so much for that, ESPN, the worldwide uh, leader in sports, basically pirating my information. But uh, Houston did not have a scholarship offer in high school. It's crazy to think about it, isn't it? I mean, it's quite the Cinderella story. Houston Harding was actually at a DeSoto Central high school baseball game because the baseball season in Mississippi started a uh, week before. So he came to see some of his summer league team mates play a high school game. While he's there, the dad of one of his summer travel team ball teammates, his, one of the dads, introduced him to a coach from Midwama Community College who basically set up a tryout. Didn't know much about him. Said, hey, we'll get you down. We'll throw a bullpen. We'll see. They offer him on a spot. Houston takes it because he had no other options to work with. You know what? This is a chance for me to play beyond the high school level. I'm going to jump on it. Goes to Itawamba. Becomes the single season and career strikeout leader at ICC. Comes to Mississippi State. Not highly recruited again, but pitched the game, or should we say the, um, the super regional clinching game against Notre Dame to get State to Omaha, and then had a couple of good starts out there in Omaha to help us win a College World Series National Championship. It is an amazing story, an absolutely amazing story. Feel really great for Houston. Feel great for his family. Had a chance to meet his folks out there in Omaha. Just fine people. And the thing about Houston Harding, too, is he is such a good guy. You like to see good things happen to good people. So I hope he makes the most of this opportunity does the best that he can, and uh, plays baseball for a long time. You know, and the thing about minor league baseball, it is kind of a cruel game, you know, especially for these guys that don't sign for a whole lot. So there's not a lot of financial investment. You know, there's not a lot of incentive to keep those guys around and give them time to develop. And the minor leagues are a different animal. You know, when you come to Mississippi State, you got to produce right away, or, you're, or you know, you're not going to play. The minors are much different. They can be a little more patient with you. But if they don't have a financial commitment made to you, they've got no reason to keep you around. So you've got to kind of get out there and get rolling. So I hope that happens for all our guys. You probably have seen that Rowdy Jordan and Tanner Allen have both signed their professional contracts. Also, not a surprise in any way whatsoever. But, you know, they get, you know, six figures and kind of get a uh, head start into life. And hopefully that sustains them. And I, I think T.A. is probably a big leaguer someday. You know, we'll see what happens. You know, I kind of wonder at times about his natural position, you know, because he's kind of limited size-wise. You know, what does he do? You know, where does he play? But, uh, you know, the guy can really hit. And so you'll find a way to get him in the order uh, somehow, some way. So that's kind of where we stand with all of that. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and thank our good friends at Bulldog Burger Company. I have been in love with Bulldog Burger Company a long time. They've been very loyal to me and very good to me. They'll be good to you, too. It's kind of who they are and what they do. They understand how to feed folks. They do. It is a great time out for yourself with your friends, your family. You can have whatever kind of nights you want. You can have that family meal, have the appetizers, get the spring rolls. Everybody gets a burger and some fries. Make it a big night. You're not going to finish that portion, so go ahead and prepare to bring it for lunch tomorrow, too. You're going to get more than you bargained for, for sure, at Bulldog Burger Company. Three great locations to serve you. University Drive here in Start Vegas, Gloucester Street there in Tupelo, Lake Harbor Drive in Ridgeland. A lot of good reviews coming out of that new location too. A lot of people have reached out and told me, said, you know what, Steve, we've never been before. It's difficult to get in there on game day. And so we've gone, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday night and had a great time at Bulldog Burger Company. You'll, you'll have a good time too. If you're listening to me, maybe you should try the Pimentology Ad Bacon. That's the Boneyard Burger of Choice. When I go, and sometimes I'm, I'm in the mood for a salad, but other times when I just want to go in there and maybe have a cheat meal, 
That's what I get. Pimentology, add bacon. Sometimes I get a side salad, sometimes I don't. Just a wild and crazy guy. You go find your own favorites. Bulldog Burger Company, the place where people go to meet. M-E-A-T. So let's get into all this Texas OU stuff. You know, several years ago, you may recall, that was the big discussion. Texas is going to join the Pac-12. They're going to be the Pac-16, be the first super conference in all of college athletics, and the whole thing fell apart. I initially thought this was more of the same. I said, you know what, this is really just kind of posturing for Texas and OU in advance of the Big 12's new TV deal, and you know they're going to do what they can to get a bigger piece of the pie because Texas and OU are the are the brands in the Big 12. It is not a great conference. It, you know, it used to be a really good conference. It's not so much. Texas also not back. Again, not back. No matter what they say, no matter what they you know try to suggest, Texas is not back. Texas also, in many respects, you know. And I say this with as much love and care as I can. Texas is a little bit like Pam Anderson. And I, I'm still a huge Pam Anderson fan. Not as much as I once was. But, you know, Pam Anderson used to be the most desirable woman in America and perhaps the world. And you know what? Pam did some things, have made some bad decisions. Pam's maybe not the cat she once was. And that's not in any way a reflection of her character. I'm just trying to say that, you know, Texas has kind of lost a little bit of its luster. You know, when they won an AFL championship in football, you know, Vince Young, they were the, they were the biggest thing around it. But I was like, man, Texas is back. It's going to be a dynasty. It's going to be great. All these great things are going to happen. And then they kind of wandered through the wilderness for a while. And so Texas is kind of like they're leaned up against the wall at the bar. And they're nursing that same Bud Light long neck all night long waiting for somebody to talk to them. Like, hey, we're Texas. Okay, well, great, you're Texas. But what does that mean today? And so I think Texas and OU, and to be fair, I think OU is probably the bigger brand right now. Texas, of course, has a much bigger athletic budget than OU does. But not not substantially, but they do. Texas is the largest athletics budget in all of the NCAA. And so there is some spending power there. So you begin to ask yourself, okay, what's really in it for Texas? You know, they get whatever they want out of the Big 12. They've got the Longhorn Network. They basically had the best financial arrangement they can possibly have in the Big 12. And so what's in it for them? Well, I'll tell you what's in it for them. Credibility. And money. And you can say, well, Steve, they have so much already. You know, if some is good, more is better. Not to mention, if Texas really wants to be back, they're not going to get back by beating Baylor and TCU and Kansas State and Kansas. Just not going to happen. You're not going to be a national power when that's how you're building a resume. Just not going to happen. And a lot of people, I think, are seeing this really mainly through football eyes. That's not really the case, if you ask me. You know, Texas is going to be preseason top two or three in the college baseball poll. Texas is really good this year. A lot of people thought David Pierce was under a lot of pressure this year to perform and he certainly was. They're going to bring a really good team back next year. And I'll be honest with you, on behalf of Mississippi State people around the globe, we're not scared of Texas. We're absolutely not scared of Texas baseball. We're better than Texas baseball, and we have proved it on the field three out of four times this year. And so when I see these people in the national media suggesting, oh, Mississippi State should be kind of leery of this move, I completely disagree. Completely. Because I think we can beat Texas. I think we can beat be, be Texas in football. I don't think Texas scares anybody in any sport at this point in their athletics department. Just don't. I don't think there's anybody in the SEC that says, you know what, hey, man, if Texas comes in here, it really shifts the balance of power. I think what it does do is it gives Mississippi State and Ole Miss and Missouri and Kentucky and others a chance to perhaps expand the recruiting footprint but also, too, it's going to make this TV deal a lot more lucrative for everybody involved. So what does it mean for the divisions? Well, you know, we are badly in need of a realignment in the SEC. As you guys know, we have Auburn in the West. They should be in the East. We have Mizzou in the East. They should be in the West. But because we've had a whole show about this before, because of that stupid game between Tennessee and Alabama that nobody cares about, absolutely nobody cares about it. Tennessee don't want to play it. 
Alabama doesn't get up for it anymore. Nobody in the conference looks at that game and says, oh, yeah, I'm going to stay home today and watch this classic because it's an absolute joke. But the rest of the conference has been held hostage. And so if you tell me that by adding a couple teams and taking this thing to 16 – that we can break that crap up, we can realign the divisions and make it more equitable for everybody else. I mean, you forget me. Missouri's got to send, you know, they got to send their softball team to go play Florida. They got to send their volleyball team across the country to go play South Carolina. And you say, yeah, but Steve, we're going to expand the footprint and, you know, we got to go into Norman, Oklahoma and Austin, Texas. Yeah, it's true, but let's make some sense of this geographically. Another byproduct of all this, too, is I I don't believe we'll stick with two divisions. I like the whole model of perhaps doing the four-team pods. I think it makes the most sense. So here is one of the possible realignment options. This was shared this morning on the SEC Network. Four four four-team pods, which I am absolutely in favor of because it allows a greater rotation in the schedule. So pod A would have Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, South Carolina. I don't suspect that uh, South Carolina is happy about that arrangement on the football side of things. Florida and Georgia would kind of maintain their rivalry, which I think is cool. Pod B, Alabama, Auburn, Tennessee, Vanderbilt. Hey, that's cool. Vandy, uh, that's three losses right out of the gate every single year. But Alabama retains the Auburn and Tennessee rivalry, and the rest of the conference is not held hostage by that. Pod C... LSU, Mississippi State, Ole Miss, Texas A&M. I'll take that right now. I'll absolutely take it right now. And then pod D would be Arkansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Texas. Now, I've seen some other possibilities out there, like the ones that have basically Oklahoma, Arkansas, Texas, and Texas A&M together. I don't think at this point A&M is happy about the arrangement. They're actually sharing – You know, I I guess somewhat privately that uh, they have veto power based on some gentleman's agreement when they join the conference. And I also understand, too, that there would be had to be four votes to over to to kind of block the merger, I guess you could say. You know, Texas A&M is going to vote against it. I think no matter what happens, A&M is going to vote against it. I don't necessarily think it means they're scared of Texas, but I think it's one of those deals where You know, we spent decades kind of being their little brother. We finally get away from them. We have some autonomy now. We don't have to listen to their mouth and have them be involved in the things that go on within our program. And now you're pulling them back in. You know, who knows? A&M may get mad enough and leave. But I think that's interesting, too. And then you could potentially have, you know, maybe Mizzou, LSU, Mississippi State, Ole Miss. So here's what the 14 pods basically would allow you to do. You would play everybody in your pod every single year, every year. And then you play two games against every other pod, and then you rotate. You'll see, you'll, you'll host everybody in the conference one time in every four years. So that means every one of your student athletes would have the opportunity to play everybody else in the SEC. You know, we played Missouri this year, right? in Davis Wade Stadium. That's the first time we played them since 15. So we went up there in 15 with Dak, we beat them, and then we come back here and then we play in 2020. So it's five years in between that. It didn't make a lot of sense to have to be that long. So that means that basically you had some student athletes never had a chance to play Missouri. I mean, how often do we play Georgia? And you know, this year we picked them up because of the uh, the COVID schedule. But There needs to be greater rotation within the football schedule. And I think that adds a lot more interest in the game. You know, you want to kind of spice up attendance. You know, give people fresh opponents. Give people a fresh trip. I mean, how many people would love to go right out there to Austin, Texas and go play Texas? You know, we've played them in bowl games. We played them at their place uh, in the early 90s with Jackie, but that's 30 years ago. And so it'd be a cool trip to go make. And we, we, you know, we go play Oklahoma. I mean, think about that. We, a chance to go to Norman, watch Bulldogs play up there. It'd be a cool thing. And so you add some new novelty to the schedule. Another byproduct of that, too, is, is because of the fact that you, you would only play your pod as an annual opponent, that means Mississippi State doesn't have to play Alabama every year. You can say, well, Steve, are we scared of Alabama? Yes, we are. We absolutely are. 
I think this would provide greater parity in the league. As I said on Jay Wimberly's show, you know, you've seen Alabama and Clemson play so much, it's kind of like watching a bad Rocky sequel. You know, it's like the same thing over and over again. It just doesn't hold your interest. But what if, say, Alabama, you know, played Virginia Tech, and all of a sudden Virginia Tech gets hot, you know, they, they work their way through the playoff, and they're upset-minded. They got a chance to go win a game. You you probably would turn in for that. You know, we all turned in, you know, when Deshaun Watson and Clemson went on and played Alabama because we thought, hey, they got a chance to beat them. Now it's just kind of boring. And so they're going to expand the playoff and all that sort of stuff to try to add more parity to it. And, yeah, listen, I I think there's a way you can implement the bowl system and use those as playoff games too. But I think that's a bigger part of this is that I think more playoff teams is smart. Initially, I said, you know what, four is enough. But, you know, now that we've done that for a few years and we see how stale it's become, let's shake things up. College athletics is supposed to be fun, not just financial. And so from our aspect, you know, yeah, we're going we're gonna to make some money from this, but we're also going to have an opportunity to have some cool trips. We're also going to have an opportunity to, you know, to host some, some opponents maybe we wouldn't ordinarily. The scheduling aspect of this is going to be very difficult because everybody wants to have seven home games. It's going to be difficult to do especially if you're going to continue to have the the Power 5 mandate that one of your non-conference games has to be a Power 5 team because that's usually going to be a home-and-home, right? This also will give us an opportunity to probably go ahead and break out the nine-game conference schedule. I'll be honest with you, I don't know how I feel about that, to be honest. I know financially it makes a lot of sense. But I know if you're, if you're a team like Mississippi State that needs, you know, four of those non-conference wins to ensure bowl eligibility, I don't know that helps us because you're going to remove one of those options and you're going to give me three non-conference games. One of those is a power five, which may be a 50-50 proposition for me, and then I go play nine conference games. So we'll see. You can say, well, Steve, I don't believe in lowering the hurdles. You know, I don't either. But let's kind of take inventory of where we are as a football team too. You know, we're a team that routinely is 4-4 and in the SEC. It's very rare that we have a winning record in the SEC. And so now all of a sudden you put us in a situation where, you know, we have to win four and then sweep our three non-conference games, including one of those being a power five. That's just to have a winning record. And so, yeah, I think from the football standpoint, it makes life a little more difficult for us. I think on the baseball side of things, it's great for us. And there are a few reasons why. One of them I'll tell you is because I think, you know, we always want to have a national recruiting profile. You know, there are going to be a lot of – there's a lot of kids that watch Mississippi State play Texas this year that, that had never seen Mississippi State play before. Just hadn't. Let's let it happen to catch us in a college World Series. And so all of a sudden, you know, we, we become more of a familiar option for people. They kind of grow up watching us play on TV out there in Texas and say, oh, yeah, these guys beat a and these guys beat Texas – you know, I think maybe that it helps us recruiting-wise. And also, too, when you think about, you know, we have a large alumni base in the state of Texas. And so it gives those people an opportunity to see a game maybe more in their backyard. I also believe this is going to be a, a financial windfall for the SEC because of the lucrative TV package that will accompany this. And, again, this is not going to happen for probably four years. I think the information that I saw is that, hey, it's, you know, Texas and OU said they're not going to renew their – their media package with the Big 12 that expires in 2025. And then there was this conference call tonight. You know, everybody's trying to find a way to retain Texas and Oklahoma and then figure out what they do. And I think what, what's going to happen, I think in many ways, is that the Big 12 that has already lost its luster in, in spades is going to have to go out there and get some other teams that just don't have the same national appeal and as a result, their TV package is not going to be as lucrative as it once was. Because, listen, there's nobody outside of the fans of Baylor and Kansas State tuning in to watch Baylor and Kansas State. But you might watch Texas you know, play Texas Tech, or you might watch Texas play Oklahoma, the Red River Shootout, right? That's a classic every year. So, you know, what's the Big 12 going to do? Go out there and, and, and get Southern Miss? Do you think there's a lot of eyeballs? I mean, they can't even get people to go to the games. Do you think that adds to the TV package? No, it doesn't. So you've got to begin to think about expansion if you're the Big 12. And and the thing that's so interesting, too, about the Big 12 
and I don't know maybe if uh, you know if we've really you know, really dug into this. Let, let's do that now. I think it's important to look the, you know the trajectory of the Big Twelve Conference. You know, people forget you know it was once a Southwest Conference and then they merged. You know, and it's just uh, it's just kind of a you know it used to be this great idea. And I think people have kind of realized, too, that the SEC has kind of just taken control of everything. I mean, just really has taken charge of everything. And it's, so here's who you have in the Big 12 right now. Baylor, Iowa State, Kansas, Kansas State, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, TCU, Texas, Texas Tech, West Virginia. So in case you lost count, that's 10 teams. So you take Texas and OU out of there, you know, who's your drawing card? You know, they added West Virginia several years ago. That's a long way away from Lubbock, Texas. So geographically, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And so do you think anybody's tuning in to watch West Virginia and TCU play outside of their fans or not? You know, Oklahoma State, I think, is probably the, you know, the little brother that gets left behind here. Because I think they all kind of see the writing on the wall, you know, the Big 12, from a basketball standpoint, is pretty good. It is. You know, baseball, it's been decent. But outside of Texas this year, who would you look at and say, yeah, that was a really dominant team? You know, with TCU was a national seed, they also didn't make it out of their regional. You know, Texas Tech was a top eight national seed, and they got absolutely drilled by Stanford in the Super. You know, so the Big 12 is a good baseball conference. It is not a great baseball conference. It once was. It no longer is. And one of the reasons why is because you've got a lot of non-baseball schools in that conference that just don't challenge the, the, you know, the hierarchy within the league. But I think, you know, when you look at it from a basketball standpoint, I mean, you've got Kansas, you know, and you've got, um, you know, Baylor has been really, really good, you know, at times. And so you look at all that and you begin to think, okay, you know, they can kind of piece this thing together. But, but what do you do when you lose your two anchors, your two drawing cards, There's more fun than ever as Cedar Point throws its biggest party ever now through August 15th. Witness the park's 150-year history in a spectacular nighttime parade. Enter every day for your chance to win a ticket of a lifetime. Ride on Snake River Expedition and taste your way around the point. Don't miss this once-in-a-lifetime celebration. Get your tickets at cedarpoint.com. No purchase necessary. Open to legal residents of the 50 United States and the District of Columbia who are 13 years of age or older. Void in Florida, New York, and where prohibited. Visit ticketofalifetime.com. Sponsor Millennium Operations, LLC, doing business at Cedar Point. If you've been a renter, you know it's stressful to find the perfect place. But Zillow Rentals make it easy. They have filters for pretty much everything, so you can find a rental that's big enough for entertaining your friends, but small enough they won't crash all weekend. Find your sweet spot on ZillowRentals.com. And so if I had to call it today, I believe this is going to happen. I didn't yesterday. I didn't. And I understand there's a lot of smoke out there, and and the thing that I go back to is there was a lot of smoke, too, back in... um, you know, several years ago when they were talking about the Pac-16. And they had Chip Brown on ESPN kind of educating everybody, saying that he had heard from uh, people in the Board of Regents at the University of Texas, this is going to happen, that's going to happen, and then nothing happened. Absolutely nothing happened. So yesterday I thought this might be a fire drill, kind of of similar proportions. I don't think that's the case now. I think there are, there's enough moving parts to this that are already in motion that this is a legitimate attempt to leave the Big 12 and join the SEC. Now, we're going to do the horns down thing. It may cost us 15 yards, but we're going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to do it in honor of Will Bednar. I, I think all that's silly. I don't think, you know, if they're going to let Ole Miss throw up the land shark every time they make a tackle with the line of scrimmage on first down, uh, then we ought to be able to throw the horns down thing. We just should. I, I, I think the whole uh, – Fins up thing is is ridiculously stupid anyway. You know, it's like, oh, you're getting beat 45 nothing, and you you make a tackle for loss, and we're going to throw up the land shark. I, I think if that happens, I think that should be flagged. You know, if it's one thing, if it's a third down stop in a big ball game, okay, well, that's allowable. But if you're getting drilled or you're drilling somebody else and you're throwing up a stupid land shark thing, I think that should be a flag. Now, I mean, not just for taunting, but because you're stupid. You, it's dumb. It's not an emotional. Uh, you know, outburst in a game that's already been decided. It's just stupidity. It's, hey, look at me. I can understand firing your teammates up. So, But, but again, 
you recall too, Pernell McPhee got, got flagged for that after he recorded a sack and threw it up, and uh, he gets flagged for it. So if, if, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So if Texas can throw the horns up, we should be able to throw the horns down. Because it's not just celebrating, you know, that there, there's, some, uh, there's some nose rubbing in that deal too. Florida throws up the gator. You know what? We beat them. We ought to be able to do the gator too. This is how I feel about it. Why do they own that? All oh, it's just kind of dumb. But, uh, but be that as it may, I chased that rabbit trail long enough. I do believe this is something that you need to pay very close attention to, and not just because there's all these hot takes in the media – it's because I believe, based on some of the people that I have talked to, that there is some validity to this. I don't think this is just political grandstanding in the court of public opinion just to get more money from the Big 12. Because Texas already runs a show out there. And I think Texas also has probably entered a situation, too, where, you know what, in order for us to expand, we have to have an even number of teams that tells me this has probably already been in the works for a while. And Texas probably kind of maybe broach the subject with the, the hierarchy of the SEC and says, hey, listen, well, who are you going to come with? And then they said, hey, what if we bring Oklahoma? Well, you know, I think it's a no-brainer. You want to talk about, you know, collecting championships as a league, here we go. We're already doing it. And then we're going to bleed, you know, one of our biggest, you know, competitors in the Power Five of their top two members, it's a power play. That's an absolute gangster move right there. And so do we end up having four super conferences? You know, do you begin to see some, uh, you know, some Big 12 teams of the final eight? Do they just basically migrate to other leagues? And you know, does Texas Tech go out there and play in the Pac-12? They, they, kind of, they kind of, you know, match in some respects anyway. They don't maybe, you know, politically or geographically, you know, when it comes to, um, you know, the scenery or anything, but, you know, they're, they're pretty far out there in Lubbock. They're, they're, they're actually you know, pretty close to a couple of Pac-12 schools you know, there in Arizona and Arizona State. So does that make sense for them? You know, do you see, you know, do, do you see Nebraska make a move? I, I would think they're probably happy where they are, but, you know, there, there is going to be a shift if this happens because what's left of the Big 12 they're going to have some decisions to make because they're, they're not going to want to back up that money. You know what I'm saying? It's like, well, well we've, we've enjoyed, you know, the fruits of Texas and OU's success and the fact that the, they draw so much in the TV ratings. We've got to find a way to compete. And so when you start looking around there, what do they do, bring an SMU? Are they forgiven now? They get to come back into the fold? Is that part of the deal? You know, Southern Miss is one of those teams that every time there is conference expansion, they always put something together because they need money. They bring nothing to the table, but they need the money. And Southern's a good baseball program, but, but let's be honest, there's nobody tuning in to watch Southern Miss play baseball. They're just not. I know there's some very passionate fans down there. I'm related to a lot of them, you know, the, the, the ones that there are. I, I know a lot of people in, in, my, in South Mississippi that are very, very, very passionate about Southern Miss athletics. They don't win enough. They don't play enough, uh, you know, top-tier talent. But they want to see the Golden Eagles win. And, you know, listen, in order for Southern Miss to begin to kind of play catch-up a little bit, they're going to have to get out of Conference USA. The, the problem is is that they just don't have enough, you know, of a drawing card to join the Power Five. I mean, who is going to go out there and take them? People forget, too, you know, when, you know, when the Metro Conference kind of disbanded, you know, Southern was one of those teams kind of left without a dance partner. And they've made petitions to try to join this and try to join that, and they just can't find anybody to take them. And there was some discussion one time that maybe Southern Miss should drop down and go FCS. You know, that, that was the thing, too, when I was a kid. There was a talk about the big three, you know, State, Ole Miss, and Southern. And when State and Ole Miss decided to stop playing Southern Miss, you know, we went to eight conference games, and they quit playing them. In many ways – it diminished the drawing power Southern Miss had for recruits. So now you no longer had to recruit against State and Ole Miss or State and Southern Miss if you're Ole Miss and vice versa. You know, Southern no longer seemed like the same option. And so we left them. We really distanced ourselves between Southern Miss and Mississippi State. There is no big three, and there hadn't been for, for basically a generation. It's a much different dynamic today. 
And so Southern is just one of those teams out there that is so desperate to have a, be- a better and bigger conference affiliation. But I can't see the Big 12 making that move. You know, wh- what do they really gain by doing that? They're probably better off going and getting Lafayette or Tulane and pulling those guys away. You know, that, that makes better sense to me. It's a new TV market for you. You know, Tulane all of a sudden gets the Big 12 in the New Orleans, and you could probably schedule some good stuff there. Just don't know. But I know this. I know that we're about to see uh, a very interesting couple of weeks here. And, again, nothing's going to happen for four years or so. You know, th- you know we'll kind of continue doing what we're doing, you know, for the next four years. But, you know, long term, this could be a good thing for Mississippi State. You know, and it's not just the fact that you begin to think, well, you know, everybody else in our conference gets richer. That's true. But all the other schools outside of our conference that we're recruiting against, they're not – they're not going to have the same ability to keep up with us in an arms race, facilities-wise. So now all of a sudden, if there's a bigger, there is a bigger pie, and while we may be getting you know, one-sixteenth of it, where we were getting one-fourteenth before, it still may be a net gain for Mississippi State Athletics, which means we can pour more money into baseball and pour more money into women's athletics. And there are a lot of facilities out there that need upgrading. And listen, I think we're great stewards of our money, and how great would it be to have a little more to go around? And, again, I think maybe on the short term, it's not the big financial, you know, free fall that maybe we hope it is. Windfall, pardon me. Uh, but I think that it could be something long term that makes, you know, good sense for Mississippi State. A little bit later in the show, I'm going to talk about some of the things that I think may be, you know, a discouraging item to consider with all this. You know, it's not all about, you know, scheduling and, and, and ticketing and, and finances. You know, there's some other things I think you have to consider uh, if you're Mississippi State. Because, you know, listen, and, and it's so funny, too, as I, I was speaking to a good friend earlier, people are like, hey, man, would you guys be scared to play Texas? Are you kidding me? We play Alabama every year. We play LSU every year. We play Auburn every year. Why would we be scared of Texas? You think Texas is better than those teams? They may be on par with a couple of them every now and again. Why would we be scared to play Texas in football? Why? We're certainly not scared to play them in baseball. Matter of fact, if y'all want to go ahead and sign up a uh, best two out of three series right now, let's go ahead and do it. I think everybody can feel good about that. We beat Texas on a neutral field. We beat them in Omaha. And, that, and take that. That's, on, that's the revenge of Gene Morgan. How about that, Longhorns? Stick that in your crawl. But there's a lot to consider with all this. But, again, I think that if, if we are honest with ourselves – and we look at the data, we look at the money available, and we look at the fact that we're going to be able to avoid playing Alabama every year in football, and that we probably get a more advantageous scheduling format within the league, I think that's a win for Mississippi State. I'm eager to see what it would look like on the baseball and basketball side. But I think the fact that you bring in Texas and OU, I think that actually strengthens the basketball reputation of this league. Because yeah, we've been up and down as a league, right? I mean, some, some years I don't even know if they're going to give us the automatic qualifier. It's like, you know, the people in the national media just act like you know, the SEC just doesn't play outside. If Kentucky doesn't win, we're not any good. And college basketball needs Kentucky to be good. It's true. It really is. But uh, I think this is something, too, that uh, it's not going to go away. It's going to be in the national discussion. And I think the Big 12 itself is powerless to stop. Texas and OU and according to national reports Texas and OU not on the conference call with the other Big 12 presidents tonight that's kind of telling in and of itself if this was a power play to get more money or to get a a sweeter deal within the league you'd think they'd be on there kind of pleading their case and okay we we really don't we really don't want to go but we will if you guys make us but if we're going to stay we got to have this if you're not on the call, that conversation doesn't take place. And so, again, I think you read the tea leaves here, and I don't think this is what we saw before. I just I, – I don't. And maybe call it a gut feeling or a somewhat educated guess after having some conversations today. I, I think the reason there is so much smoke about this nationally is that a lot of people in the media – have done their due diligence and found that there is some credibility in some of the reports – and so now everybody's looking to break the story and that sort of stuff. And so you've got a lot of talented people kind of working through this, 
a lot of people kind of comparing notes now. I think everybody feels like, you know what, this is this is something that's kind of unfolding before our eyes that uh, we weren't expecting. And don't think it's a, it's a coincidence that all this was leaked right here in the middle of SEC Media Days. I mean, there's, there, that's released for maximum impact. So whoever is kind of pulling the strings knows what they're doing. I think that's pretty apparent at this point. All right, let's talk top ten lists. Brought to you by johnnypacker.com. johnnypacker.com. If you're looking for sunglasses, and you should be, we're in the middle of summer. Aren't you tired of squinting? I know I am. I'm waiting for my new glasses to come in now. But I got prescription lenses, and I can't, cannot wait to get them in. I'm so tired of walking around squinting with all this sun in my, my face. You know, I've already got a solution in, in plan. What about you? Are you still walking around squinting? Are you driving every day? You're having to you know, hold your hand up to kind of shield your eyes from the sun. Why, why do that? Ride more comfortably. Order some brand new sunglasses today from johnnypacker.com. Great frames, all named after Mississippi towns, except for the Omaha frames, which are really, really cool. Go by, check them out today. These are very well-constructed glasses. I have a pair. And, uh, you know, very well-constructed. They don't pinch your nose. They're very comfortable. That's one of the things that I hate about glasses sometimes is that even if they don't pinch your nose, they kind of ride up and down your face. Not these. These kind of stay in place. I think you'll be happy with them. Don't go out and buy some cheap sunglasses. I tell you, I was I was driving to Jackson the other day, and I thought about just picking up a cheap pair uh, just to kind of you know finish up my day, you know, because I, I had an appearance to make down there, and I was just thinking, I, I wish I had my sunglasses because I'm so tired of uh, of having a squint. And it's like thirty bucks. It's like thirty bucks for some cheap, you know, non-brand sunglasses. Why not spend a little bit more? Because there's a difference between price and cost. Get a quality product at a decent price at johnnypacker.com. And by being a loyal Boneyard listener, we'll save you a little money. Use promo code Boneyard, and that'll get you uh, 10% off your purchase. And part of your proceeds will go directly to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation to help improve the quality of life of those that struggle with CF. John Packer himself struggles with that, and he's doing what he can to kind of improve the uh, quality of life for others. So you're not just doing business with Bulldogs. You're doing with somebody who has a heart to help others. If you go on that website and you see that uh, perhaps that uh, the frames you want show sold out, don't panic. Send them an email. They'll get them on order for you. Simple as that. JohnnyPacker.com, promo code Boneyard. Okay, so we're going with Roy's pick today. Headed back from dinner and Roy's like, hey, it's country tomorrow, right? And it is country today. I said, uh, so who's your horse? Who you got? He gave me a couple of options, and uh, I couldn't believe that we hadn't done one of these. It's Johnny Cash. So we're doing Johnny Cash today, an American icon. And this, this, this is a very extensive catalog. And, and many of you kind of grew up with Cash, and some of you are maybe, you know, new time Listeners, you know, maybe you're a new generation type person. You're just kind of getting around and listening to Johnny Cash. You know, when I was a kid, I used to ride around in my dad's Monte Carlo. He had Johnny Cash on a track. We listened. To, we listened to Johnny for a while. We listened to Will and Jennings for a while. A little Willie Nelson every once in a while. The Statler Brothers. Sometimes a little Juice Newton. That's right, playing with the Queen of Hearts. But Johnny Cash and Will and Jennings always seem to be my dad's favorites. So I can't believe we hadn't done this one yet. So we're going to do Johnny Cash today. So here we go. Top 10 Johnny Cash tunes, according to me. You may disagree, and that's fine. This is America. You have the right to be wrong. Number 10, and actually this is a Chris Christopherson song. It was written by Chris. It's a Sunday morning coming down. It's about a hangover. Most of us have been there. Some of you guys were good boys and girls. But uh, that's what it's about. And this is when Chris Christopherson was kind of really struggling to make it. Yeah, Chris is an incredible songwriter. You know, he wrote me and Bobby McGee, too. The Janis Joplin made an absolute super hit. But Sunday Morning Coming Down, a song written by Chris Christopherson and then recorded by Johnny Cash. Number nine, also a song that Johnny didn't write but made famous it's not a cover it's just a song that he picked up and did it's a boy named sue a lot of people laugh about that title but you know you know the dad's leaving and he names the the kid sue so he'd toughen him up in life it's uh that's the thing too about johnny cash songs is there is uh there's a lesson in a lot of these things 
He is a great storyteller. A lot of music today is pointless, to be honest with you. There's nothing to it, you know, other than perhaps a glorification of some someone's ego. But Johnny Cash is a guy that did a great job kind of telling a story. It's where he and Willie Nelson, Will and Jennings, that whole generation of country, they were really good at that. Kenny Rogers, kind of balladeers in many respects. Number eight, don't take your guns to town. It's one of those things, too. Guy thought he was the best. Mom cautioned him, hey, don't do it. I won't give away the punchline, but you probably know what happens. Number seven, a song that uh, has been played as part of marketing campaigns uh, throughout the country for the last uh, few years is I've Been Everywhere. I've Been Everywhere, man. I've Been Everywhere. And what it's about is it's a kid gets into an 18-wheeler as a hitchhiker and listens to all these lessons and all these great stories about where the trucker's been. Number six, I once thought this was a cover song. And I used to think it was about Jackson, Mississippi. It's not. It's actually about Jackson, Tennessee. But it is the song Jackson. It's a duet Johnny sang with June Carter. An absolutely cool track. We, you know, we can claim it. We'll call it about Jackson, Mississippi if we want to. But uh, it was about Jackson, Tennessee. But, you know, we may as well make it our own. Number five, and this is, uh, I guess, in many ways, kind of a song that is... Uh, you know, kind of symbolic of who Johnny Cash is. It's Man in Black. Johnny always wore black, just about exclusively. But he kind of explains why he wore, wore black in the uh, in this track. You know, a lot of it's about people that you know, he wore black because he feels bad for people, and you know, a lot of people don't have things and never had any religious training or anything like that. So there's a lot. It's kind of a poignant song. I think the final four are ones that we can probably all agree on. I don't know if we agree on the order. I know many of you, because of Jonathan Holder, would have this song number one. I have it number four. But I love the vibe of the song. I like the way that it builds. I love the opening bars. It's just one of those things. And, and it's maybe it's because I have so many good memories of Jonathan Holder. But number four is God's going to cut you down. And I've actually heard some other people use that as a walkout. And I just kind of reject that on principle. You know, if you got, you know, Jonathan Holder and Johnny Cash and one of the lyrics in the song is John, you know, John, do this, John, do that. It just makes sense that it's Jonathan Holder's. And listen, I know that uh, he's been gone for several years, but I've kind of got a problem with people kind of, you know, jumping on that bandwagon. Find your own stuff. Number three. I love the live version of this because I think John, I think Johnny's vocal on this is actually better live than it is in the studio, but it's Folsom Prison Blues. I just love the conviction in Johnny Cash's voice. He, he doesn't have a wide range, but he has just this warm voice. And when he says something, you believe it. And when he sings it, you feel like it's coming directly from his heart. Even if he's not singing his song, he's just such an authentic performer that you just kind of, you know, you kind of empathize with him as he sings these songs, many of them uh, very sad in nature. Number two, many of you would have this number one. I have it too, but it's I Walk the Line. It's it's, it's a song in many ways of empowerment. You know, it's one of those things like, you know what, this is the things that I do, and I pay the bills, and I get out there, and I do this, and I do that, and I stand up for myself, and I represent my family. I walk the line. But number one for me is Ring of Fire. I don't know why, but I've always loved it. I just have. Maybe it's because uh, I can kind of visualize what's happening, you know, with the song. But Ring of Fire is it for me, number one. So if you have an idea for the top ten list, reach out let me know. Again, today was Roy's idea, and... uh, I think sometimes Roy swings for defenses. Like sometimes I'm happy, you know, just kind of getting a single and then, you know, manufacturing a run. You know, sometimes I'll do some obscure 80s metal just because I want to do it. And uh, I think I surprised him with our recent rock covers top 10 list here a couple weeks back. The most listened to Spotify list we have. How about that? It unseated Creed that was number one that all of you say you don't listen to. I don't listen to Creed, but you do. We have the numbers to prove it. Many of you said you didn't listen to Nickelback, but you do. We have the numbers to prove it. 
But I think sometimes I think Roy, I think he, I think he wants to uh, to pick these lists and say, "Yeah, man, I told you so." And Roy's my friend, so he can get away with that. But I think this is one that that uh, he was pretty excited about was cash. And so we've done it. We'll get back on some rock stuff next week. And again, I'm trying to work in a country show every week. We'll try to get back on schedule. But I really wanted to do Lillian Axe on Wednesday. And again, that's probably a double. You know, it's not a home run. But it's important to me. I love Lillian Axe. Love Johnny Cash. It reminds me, again, it reminds me of riding around with my dad. You know, as a kid. You know, riding around, getting that, uh, getting that Slurpee, that snow cone, whatever. You know, and, or getting a Yoohoo soda. Riding around with my dad. Listening to Johnny Cash. Had the windows down. Yeah, you know, I get nostalgic just thinking about it. And you know, that's that's the best thing about music. It's the best time machine there is. But again, if you have ideas for top ten lists, reach out, let me know. Some of you guys have some obscure ideas, and um I don't know that I can do them justice. I mean, people you recommend some bands that I've kind of heard of, and, and I listen, I don't know that anybody has a more extensive playlist than I do. But you some of you guys are asking me for top ten lists for, for bands that were one hit wonders. And so it's difficult to kind of piece that together. And listen, I know there are some bands out there that are very important to me that if I did a top 10 list, you would you probably hadn't heard a song. But um, you know, just kind of hanging in here with me. We'll get to it. It's a long summer, right? All right, next segment of the show brought to you by CloseWithBlair.com. That's B-L-A-I-R, Blair, CloseWithBlair.com. Blair, a great mortgage lender in the top 1% of Fairway Mortgage, which is one of the top five mortgage companies in the country. Blair and I were texting earlier today. He goes, you know, many of you have all this new national championship swag. Maybe you went out and got the flag or you got the bench or you got the road sign. Yeah, maybe it's time that you dress up a new house. Maybe you got the perfect national championship swag, but you don't have the perfect house. Maybe you went out and got all this cool stuff framed and you put it on your walls and it makes it look kind of old, you're happy to have it, you know, maybe it's time to make a change. The thing about Blair, too, it's 21 years in the business, man. I mean, 21 years is a long time to do anything. 21 years in the industry, seeing the ups and downs. And, and there, listen, let me give you some insider tips here. A little birdie told me rates about to go down. It may be the perfect time for you to refi or make that home purchase or even maybe perhaps you know, purchase an investment property. They've got some loans, too, if you want to invest in perhaps a fixer-upper. So give Blair a call. He'll be happy to give you all the information. Somebody you can trust. I believe in doing business with Bulldogs whenever I can. You should, too. Blair is one of those people that uh, I have known a long time, and uh, he is somebody that's actually earned my trust in many respects. Give Blair a call today at 601-500-2344. Again, 601 601- Five zero zero two three four four. Again, that's closewithblair.com. Okay, let's talk about some of the things this Texas OU merger might be a problem for. I, I mentioned uh, back in the earlier segment that we may have an issue, you know, because it may be more difficult for Mississippi State to become bowl eligible. That is a very real concern. And so I think when you look across the board, you begin to think, okay, if we're bringing in two blue bloods in college athletics, not just in football, I think both of them are really football powers in their history. But these are teams that are going to be competing with us and in many respects making it more difficult to get to postseason. In every sport. Now, we're going to be obviously battle-tested, but also, too, I think it puts us in a situation where maybe we have an average year. You know, an average year for us, we may end up having a, you know, a good year, but at the same time, too, not get what we need to get to be in the NCAA tournament. You know, maybe we go 500 in the league, and then, and despite the fact that we had the best league in the country, that's not enough to get us in. Those are some of the things that I think about. And not just in the big three sports, but, you know, you know think about our softball team. Now, all of a sudden, you know, we give Sam Ricketts and Tyler Bratton an opportunity to get out and go do some great things, and now in order to, uh, to get ahead in the SEC, now you've got Texas and OU you got to deal with. So it makes their job more difficult. I don't you know, women's basketball. Now all of a sudden you're bringing Vic Schaefer back into the league. And, you know, the first thing people say is, oh, you'll have, you know, Schaefer and uh, and Don Staley. I don't care about that. I don't care about that at all. It doesn't mean anything to me. But now all of a sudden we're going to have to go out there and play. Our ladies are going to have to go to Austin, Texas and play Vic Schaefer. 
Yeah, I don't know how appealing that is. Yeah, you make it more difficult. And then, you know, there's really no guarantee, you know, you know, is Texas going to come in here and expect to be treated like everybody else? Or is Texas going to come in here with that same sense of entitlement they've always had in the Southwest Conference to Big 12? Are they going to come in here and be a good soldier, be a good teammate? Or are we, are we going to get Ole Miss on steroids? And we've already got one group of people with a self-entitlement. The difference is Texas just has a, a, a trophy case filled with championships. And so those are things that I wonder about. You know, culturally, how good a fit is this? Not to mention, you know, we talk about the novelty of going to Oklahoma. You know, how often are we going to have to do that? You know, how does the rotation work away from football? Is it going to be the same? We're going to have four pods in every sport? How do we crown a champion? Do we have basically the four pod winners have a playoff game and then they play the SEC championship game? Is that allowable? Those are things we kind of got to figure out, right? Or do we have four pods and then the best two, the best team, the two teams with the best records, then go to the SEC championship game? Well, what if the two best teams in the league are, say, Florida and Georgia, and they're locked in the same pod? How is that fair? You know, so what's equitable? There's a lot to figure out with all of this, for sure. I think there's also, you know, when you begin to think about the name, image, and likeness situation. You know, all of a sudden, you know, more of your games are going to be high, more high profile. So as a result, there's going to be more opportunities for influencing, more opportunities for marketing. And so how big a part of the discussion does that become? Yeah, obviously, if that's the case, the name, image, and likeness opportunities should probably favor the schools in the Southeastern Conference because we're probably going to be on TV a lot more, probably on a much bigger stage. And so how much of that becomes part of the recruiting piece? And that's already something we've talked about, you know, for months, those, you know, though it was coming. And everybody kept saying, oh, no, it's not going to be part of the recruiting piece. It absolutely is. And if you don't think Nick Saban knew what he was doing when he got out there and said that a quarterback has never started a game as a millionaire, you don't think it's got anything to do with recruiting, you're kidding yourself. Nick Saban's crazy like a fox. That's exactly what he's doing. And so now all of a sudden you bring in some uh, some big market teams into the conference, you know, from a recruiting standpoint, you know, it's like, hey, so, yeah, it's between you and Mississippi State and Texas, you know, for this kid that's playing baseball. It's like, oh, if you come to Texas, everything's bigger in Texas. You know, we've got this big old tycoon out here that's it's willing to uh, give you a name, image, and likeness contract to just go do some personal appearances, and uh, that's basically going to make it 100% scholarship for you. Or you go to Mississippi State, you know, they'll give you your 33%. Maybe they come up with a cable TV advertising deal. You know, maybe there's a telephone company there that allows you to do that. I mean, you know, yeah, sure, we can compete for a handful of kids, but we're not going to have enough money to compete with Texas head-to-head on this name, image, and likeness stuff. We don't have it now. We don't have to deal with it as much, but all of a sudden if they become a member institution of the Southeastern Conference, you kind of force to deal with it. And you know, maybe that's not a big deal to you. I think it is. To, I think it is for all of us, though. I think this name, image, and likeness thing is going to be a huge part of the recruiting piece as we move forward. And everybody, the NCAA can say what they want to. You know, they've got to regulate this state to state right now. But there needs to be national legislation to ensure level playing field. I think in Texas and Florida, high school athletes, or maybe California and Florida, high school athletes can sign a name, image, and likeness deal and retain their eligibility. That, that doesn't seem fair. You can't do that in Mississippi. In Mississippi, the, the, you know, the state law says you have to be enrolled in college for that. So there is still a lot to unpack. There really is. You know, I don't think we fully appreciate, you know, what this could do. But I, I definitely, in many respects, makes the league more competitive. And that may not be the best thing for Mississippi State. You know, for, for forever and a day, you know, we with 10-team conference, and then we go out and add Arkansas and South Carolina, and that seemed absolutely foreign to us. That happened, what, back in 91? I think we all started playing div- divisions in 92. Had the SEC championship game, the first one ever, and everybody said, oh, this is going to be a complete disaster. The SEC is going to knock its own champion, regular season champion, out of the NAFL championship picture. Didn't, didn't, it didn't happen. And then we bring in Missouri and Texas, M, Texas A&M back in, what, 2012, 
bring us to 14 schools, and that seemed really weird too. At first, it was kind of cool, and now we've kind of grown accustomed to it. But even though Missouri still feels like they're they're uh, they're squatting, and Missouri doesn't feel like an SEC team, still feels kind of weird. You know, maybe maybe those guys, maybe we trade Texas and OU for Missouri and A and M. Maybe that's what happens. I don't know, but there's just so many moving pieces to this. I I don't think that anybody's going to get out of this without seeing some new teams in and out of their conference. And I love, too, these people that say, oh, well, the SEC should just kick out State and Ole Miss. Can't do it. We're charter members. Can't do it. And and it's it's amazing these people that have these hot takes and such opinions, they don't know this kind of stuff. There are a lot of people in sports journalism that don't know sports. They just don't. They just kind of write. They write their hot take. And everybody goes and clicks on it because the headline is so outrageous and they can kick it back at their desk and say, man, look how many people read my stuff. Nobody's reading your stuff except to kind of figure out what you're trying to say in your headline. So you write provocative stuff without any facts. You just conjecture an opinion. Doesn't mean anything. We're not going anywhere. Everybody can relax. We're not going anywhere. All right, next segment of the show brought to you by Campus Bookmart. Longtime sponsors of the show, man. I love them to death. I was texting with Ms. Kathy Brown earlier. Uh, Campus Bookmark not going to be at the extravaganza this year. And the reason why is because they're still inundated with orders. Just can't take a show on the road. they got to get all these online orders together. It's their stock arriving every day. They're turning it around as quickly as they can, putting it in an envelope and getting it out to you. So they're going to work through that. They're going to take care of you guys first rather than running down there and uh, working there at the extravaganza in Jackson. So if you need something from Campus Bookmark, you're either going to have to go by and see the lovely, talented Susie or – you're going to have to order online at campusbookmart.net. And if you are ordering online, let me save you some money. You never thought listening to a podcast would make you some money. Well, this one does. Go to campusbookmart.net and use promo code BSR, which stands for Beautiful Steve Robertson. And that'll get you free shipping on all orders over $50. Any order less than 50 bucks, absolutely incomplete. Okay. Over the course of the last couple of days, I've spent some time talking with your two Mississippi State uh, baseball transfers. That, that that might not be the end of it, just so you know. That might not – if we can find a quality arm, especially from the left side, and I know those guys are at a premium. Everybody's looking at those guys. Everybody's chasing them, but we are the national champions, okay? And we return a nucleus of a team that's probably going to go back to Omaha next year. So we offer perhaps a better opportunity for a one-year player than some other schools do. A lot of other people out there talking about championships. We want it. You got to take a back seat to nobody in baseball. So Jess Davis was the first. Jess actually was committed to Mississippi State while we were in Omaha. And I get it. They probably wanted to kind of hold the public announcement so it wasn't a distraction while we were in Omaha. You know, it's like, oh, you know, well, you know Rowdy and T are moving on. Everybody knows this. But, uh, you yeah, know, the focus was on the team focuses on what Mississippi State had going on at the time, focus on the College World Series. Talk to Jess. I don't know if you guys know this. At UAB, he stole 77 career bases. 77. That's third in program history. And he still has a couple years of eligibility remaining. Now, we don't expect him to use them both. This is a guy that was easily going to go over 100 stolen bags in his career at UAB. Now, got to get the uh, the batting average up a little bit, you know, but he's a guy that's hitting around 280. Also got a little bit of power, left-handed stick, but, uh, you know, a guy that can bunt, a guy that can hit, uh, hit and run with the guy, but also a guy, too, that is a plus defender. He's not just a base stealer. Guys, he had 100, what, 186 attempts and made every play. Had a perfect 1,000 fielding percentage and was awarded the Golden Glove by Rawlings and the ABCA. This is a plus defender. Now, I'm going to say some things, and you're going to think I'm being negative, and I'm not. You know, we just won a NAFL championship, and I don't know that we had a plus defender in the outfield. And that's just being honest. You know, I think Jake was probably a little bit quicker off the bat, kind of getting those balls in the gap. And that's not to say that Rowdy didn't play hard for us or play well for us. I just think Rowdy's probably a left fielder. You know, and T.A.'s a guy that's kind of learned on the fly. Those guys played well for us. 
but there were some times, you know, especially when balls got near the wall, we didn't we didn't play it very smoothly. You know, there were times it was a bit of an adventure out there. And again, that's T8 is trying to find a place to to play at the next level. You know, he he can't play first base at 510. You can get away with it a little bit in college, but not you're not going to play it in the pros. You know, Braylon Skinner's a guy that uh, is very good at tracking balls out in the gap. But there were times too that uh, you know, it was a bit of an adventure. You know, Jess Davis is a guy, you know, based on reports and talking to people that uh, are very, very close to the situation, I'll tell you, you know, he's arguably a better defender than anybody we had on the roster this year in outfield. You know, Brad Cummins is a great defender in many respects. Uh, maybe not, you know, the, the most explosive first step, but this is a guy that kind of runs the baseball down and kind of understands how to play it. But I told Jess Davis defensively, is probably better than anybody we had last year. Now, the clutch gene is yet to be seen, but he brings, you know, a skill set we didn't have. This is a true gap-to-gap center fielder that can steal bases for you. And that's an element we didn't have last year. We just didn't. And that's not to say that we were liability in the outfield. I'm not suggesting that at all. But when you've got a guy out there that can run gap-to-gap, there's not a lot that's going to fall. Excited about what this guy brings to the table. And, again, Gotro working with him on his swing and kind of working through pitch recognition, I think it's going to help. About to get coached by one of the best coaching staffs in America. He was draft eligible this year, went to the portal just to be sure if he didn't get drafted that he would have an opportunity to go play somewhere and and, uh, compete for a championship, perhaps boost his professional stock. One of the first phone calls he got was from Chris Limonis, and now he's on his way. Spoke to R.J. Yeager yesterday. Really impressed with him, too. Both Jess and R.J., very articulate. Uh, Jess tells me they're expected to room together when they get here. Probably a good thing. Two guys kind of figuring it out together. But R.J. is a guy that has played shortstop exclusively in college. That doesn't mean that he's going to play shortstop in Mississippi State. What I understand is, is that all those guys, Cam James and – R.J. Yeager and Lane Forsythe and Davis Mesh and all those guys are going to get out there and compete. Now, I think Cam James is entrenched at third, and I understand that he has taken some strides defensively at, in, at the Cape, and you know how well he played in the postseason? He was phenomenal. You know, part of the uh, only team in the history of the College World Series to win the College World Series without making an error. But I'm told that Coach Polk has worked ex- extensively with him out in the Cape, he's making some strides as a defender. He was already making some, and all of a sudden, you know, we've got a little bit of a boost here. And so I think he stays at third. I think Forsythe and Jaeger probably battle it out at short. You know, I haven't seen Jaeger play, but I'll be honest with you, if he's going to beat out Lane Forsythe defensively at short, then he is probably going to be, you know, A pretty high draft pick. Lane Forsythe is a very, very natural defender. He's just a guy that kind of measures his steps well, charges the baseball, goes and gets it, and whips it around there pretty well. There are a lot of people out there to let the ball play them. That's not Lane Forsythe. He will go get the baseball. He understands what it takes to play defense. I see, read, and hear a lot of criticism of Lane Forsythe at times offensively. And some of that's warranted, to be honest with you. But not defensively. I know he booted a couple balls around you know, early in the year when he was kind of figuring some things out. But that kid, it was money down the stretch. He was outstanding down the stretch. And I think a lot of it's just getting comfortable. And the fact that you know he, he goes up there and makes the All College World Series team, the kid's legit. Does he have to hit better? Absolutely. But I think in a couple of years, this guy's going to be probably you know, one of the, the premium defensive shortstops in the country. I think there's any question. He's just so smooth in transition. There are a lot of guys that can get to it, you know, but it's such a struggle to get it out of their glove and kind of get the throw made. And they, have to, they pick it up and are almost robotic in what they do. They get it, and then they, they got to, you know, you know, chop wood, got to get upright. It's just not the case with Lane. This is a guy that fields it low, can take a couple of strides and, and throw a strike across the bases and not have to kind of stop with momentum going towards first. I'm a big Lane Forsyth fan defensively. A little bit harder on him at times this year offensively, but you know what? I know he's probably nobody harder on him than himself. 
But I think what you're going to get to in the end here is that, you know, either Jaeger or Forsyth will play second. You know, again, not having seen Jaeger, you know, I don't know how well he's going to play defensively. But, uh, you know, he could be almost a Justin Foscue type guy. He get 13 bombs last year. You know, this is a guy, too, that's, you know, it's contact hitter that also has some power. But I'm also told even at 6'3", 200, he is a guy that can really make the defensive bend. This is a guy that can get down there and play. There are a lot of guys that size are a little stiff, a little reluctant to kind of get their face in the dirt. Not Jaeger. Everybody I talk to tells me this is a really good get for Mississippi State. So when you begin to think about, you know, what we lost to either, you know, graduation or to draft – and what we have coming back, you know, I don't know if anybody can be quite as good as Scotty DeBro was defensively down the stretch. The guy was outstanding all year. He struggled at times at the plate, but uh, he was money down the stretch. And so, you know, if you bring in Jaeger and maybe he takes down the second base spot, and maybe he's a Justin Foscue type. I mean, he's got the same build. You know, maybe he's a better athlete. Who knows? But all of a sudden you bring in another double-digit home run guy. So we already talked about this some. You, know, you, you feel like Cam James, who was a double-digit home run guy this year, be back. Logan Tanner, same situation. Luke Hancock, same situation. You feel like Kellum Clark will make a jump this year playing every day, and he'll be a double-digit home run guy. And you start thinking, okay, between those guys, you know, you're probably talking 60 home runs combined. Now all of a sudden you add another 10 to 15 in there with a guy like Yeager. All of a sudden offensively your team has gotten a lot more potent. You know, how many times this year, you know, once we got through the five hole, we start kind of holding our breath, thinking, okay, can we get a hit by pitch or a walk here, or reach on an error, kind of turn the order over? You know, you get Davis, you know, a guy that can steal a base with regularity, you know, and a guy that can defend really well. Maybe that's your leadoff hitter. Maybe he's in the one hole next year. You know, does Cam James stay in the three hole? I don't know. But, you know, when you've got that kind of speed on the bases ahead of the three and four hitter, you begin to think, you know, what, a base hit scores a run. And this is a guy, too, that can run himself in a scoring position without the benefit of a hit. That's a real weapon to have. And let's just say, let's just say, you know, you you get Jaeger in the lineup down there because you, you feel like, okay, you know, T.A. and Rowdy are gone. And do you do bat those guys one and two? I'm, Cam James, three. Does Cam go to two? Does Jaeger go to three? Jaeger's been a three-hole hitter a lot of his career, so he's used to seeing breaking balls. So clearly he's a guy that can recognize spin or he wouldn't stay in that spot. And so you begin to think now that this adds length to the lineup. And Lamonis talks about that a lot. You want to add length to the lineup because there are a lot of times, too, and even early in the year especially, you're kind of working through all this stuff and you, and you realize you know, there were a lot of times this year once we got through the, the top and you know, we got to the bottom third of the order, we really struggled to put the ball in play. Now down the stretch, second half of the year, as Cumbus began to kind of round in a midseason form, that changed for us. You know, Lane Forsyth – kind of up and down at times. But, uh, yeah, listen, we, that guy's played a lot more baseball than we expected. Then you plug Kellum Clark in the lineup every day. And, you know, we only had the Twin Towers down the stretch of the postseason, if you recall. Just didn't have it. There were times we had Kellum Clark. I mean, Kellum Clark was starting left fielder on Hoover. But when we got into the regional, you know, we stacked those guys together, Cumbus from the right, Clark from the left. Had some big sticks down there, and had, those guys had some big hits for us. Without question. And so now you, when you begin to look at the, the maturation of your returning players and the addition of these transfer players, I think you can feel good about life. We're going to be able to defend. We're going to be able to score. You know, it's all going to boil down to pitching. You know, we, we feel like we've got a pretty good handle on what we think it should be, but you know, the fall is going to be a big part of this. We're going to have to figure these things out in the fall. Define the roles on this pitching staff here in the months to come. I continue to hear from some people that, you know, that I think would know, people that know talent, and say, you know what, Mississippi State might actually be a better team next year. Not guaranteeing they win it or they even get to Omaha. But Mississippi State, on paper, is a better team next year than they were this year. That's pretty scary to think about. Final segment of the show brought to you by Portico. I told you guys before, if I was moving to Starkville now, I would move to Portico. I live out in the sticks. I love it out here. I like not having a lot of neighbors. I don't have any nosy neighbors. Nobody's ever brought me a pound cake. I never brought them one. There's never any Benny Welcome Wagon, that kind of stuff. I'm cool with that. I don't need to be made to feel special. But if I had to do it over again, if Portico would have been here when I moved to Starkville, I would move there. I absolutely would. Great neighborhood right there by campus. And that's the thing for me. As a guy that spends a lot of time on campus, I like being able to be close 
it's a drive for me now. It really is. I'd love the convenience of being that close to campus, but also, too, you know, it's out of town, you know, so it's not so much hustle and bustle. You don't have to fight 12 as much. But I love the location. I love the construction. I love the layout up there. You can get a two-bedroom, two-bath house, four-bedroom, four-bath house. You know, basically any kind of home to fit your needs, whether it be your, you know, your primary residence or an investment property or your home away from home for game day weekends, Portico has got exactly what you need. Very easy to get to. You turn off of 82 on a 12, like going to campus. The very first right is Pat Station Road. That'll take you to Portico. It's absolutely worth going to check out. And, you know, if you're one of those people, too, that said, you know what, Steve, maybe someday. Today's the day, okay? Today is the day that you're going to change your life because you're going to get information. And you're going to find out this is doable. Call Brooks Bryan, one of our favorites, 601-416-8075. Again, that's 601-416-8075. Brooks, a former Diamond Dog, a guy that's invested in Mississippi State, a guy that's invested in Starkville, trying to make it a better place. Make Portico your next move. Okay, next weekend, Top Dog Camp will be here. That'll be Friday evening. Be awfully important. You know, these camps, you know, people forget to, you know, we've been in a dead period now for the better part of a month, and the guys were only able to kind of get back on campus for about a month, and so a lot of guys are kind of making up for lost time. So, you know, it's going to be a busy, busy weekend next weekend. Uh, State, Ole Miss both having events. So we'll kind of have an idea about some of these targets we're both recruiting. If somebody chooses them over us, uh, that might be a hint and a half for us. Mississippi State currently with 15 commitments in the class. Going to have nine spots left, I think is correct, nine spots left because uh, Jameer Calvin will count ahead to 2022. So got to be a little bit picky here. Got to work in the trenches. You got to find a way to get uh, you know, a couple more O line prospects and you know, probably three more D lines, and then we may have some reshuffling and defensive back. I think a lot of that's going to depend on you know who all works out next weekend and how well they do. You know, there's some guys that are committed to Mississippi State that didn't work out in June that uh, will need to work out this time. And a lot of it too. I mean, you know, if you're committed and you want, wouldn't you want to go try your coach on for size anyway? I mean, you're not going to trick anybody into giving you a scholarship. It's not how life works. And so, yeah, you say watch the tape, yeah, that's true. But, you know, I got to see if you can take coaching. I got to see what you do when I put you in a stressful situation. I got to see, you know, what, what do you do when I put you in a situation where things aren't fair? How do you respond? Do you pout? Do you compete? Do you ask for guidance? You know, there's just a lot of things that the camp environment, you know, kind of helps you learn. Those are the things that are important. It's not as simple as, okay, how does he play when the band is playing? That's what matters most. But at the end of the day, too, I, I got to work with this kid every day. And you know, this kid's got to learn how to a- accept coaching. This is a guy that's got to understand how, you know, how to refine technique. And so if I don't at least get the chance to take him for a test drive in a camp, how can I feel really confident that this is a guy that's going to fit our culture and our system? And so there's some guys, again, that need to come work out and have a good show. And, you know, it, things may go well, and we never have to hear about it. But, you know, I, I know that states still kind of line them up some opportunities Uh, They're in a secondary. You already got seven guys committed. You needed to get that many guys committed because last year defensive back recruiting was such a struggle for us. So we'll kind of move forward with that. I'm eager to get to that. A lot of people say, well, Steve, who's the next commitment? You know, I think right now everybody's kind of in a holding pattern, but we might see business pick up next week. I know Bryson Hurst is a guy we all kind of got our eyes on. He nearly committed to state back in June, and then he went to a camp at Florida State. That They've kind of fallen from – you know, from the ranks of the uh, of the favored schools. I really believe it's going to boil down to State and Ole Miss, and he has been on both campuses uh, here recently. You know, obviously with uh, Terrell Buckley, you know, being very close to the Gulf Coast, you know, growing up most of his years in Pascagoula, you know, he has some connections down there, some people obviously in the Gaucher area that can kind of tell him how to cow eats the cabbage. You know, State's working that angle really hard too. But, again, he nearly committed when he was here. And then you hear the old Miss side, they think they have all the momentum. I think what we have here is an impressionable young man that probably doesn't see a lot of difference between Mississippi State and Ole Miss. And I think that's, that's the job of a recruiter now is to kind of explain, hey, this is a better fit for you culturally, and here's why. Here's what we've done at your position. Here's what they've done, and here's why you should pick us. And so, you know, that's the thing is once you find out they're interested, you've got to find a way to beat the other guy. That's what recruiting's all about. And it's not just, hey – we're the best, come play with the best. you got to kind of break things down and say, listen, this is how we're going to develop you. This is our plan for you. 
This is how we're going to make things happen. This is how you're going to graduate. So there's a lot that goes into it rather than just, you know, what the school colors are. You know, it's a big, big difference. So I want to update you guys, too, on the, on the new book. I'm kind of rolling right through this thing, and uh, I'm working really, really hard. And so as a result, you know, I'm not getting to spend as much time with my family. And so when I do get a chance you know, to kind of break away for a while, I go do that. You know, missed a couple of chat sessions this week, and I know that lets people down. But, um, you know, this is a, it's a very important 60 days for me here to kind of finish this thing up. And we got to get this thing off to edit and then off to print so we can have it, you know, under your Christmas tree uh, this holiday season. So the way this works is uh, I write a chapter. I sit down, get all my quotes together, and uh, go back and go through the game recaps and I write, you know, write some backstory and that sort of stuff. And so we write a, I write a chapter, and then I send it in, and then uh, you know my publisher takes it, and then it goes through a round of editing, and then comes back to me with suggested changes or you know thumbs up here, you know thumbs down there, and some things that we got to work on. And it's a very humbling process. It really is because, you know, my heart is in every word. But I admit, you know, sometimes, you know, when I'm kind of working through this thing, that, that there's some things that I miss. And uh, that's why you have editors to kind of help you go through that. And so you know, you'll be happy to know I've got uh, six chapters down. You know, started writing this, you know, here a couple of weeks ago. Had everything laid out and I've got a writing schedule put together. And basically I'm roughing out four chapters a week. It's quick, right? It is. But, you know, I've got some interviews to do. I'm going to save those for a little bit later in the summer. And so once we get, I'm basically going through this, through every week of the season is a chapter until we get to Omaha. And then that'll be a week in and of itself. So you'll have a week, you know, when we, our bracket play and then a week in the College World Series, Final Series. And so I'm going through writing a chapter and, uh, you know, giving you some inside information and also, too, kind of letting you know, you know, reminding you of how things happen. And, and it's amazing to me the things you forget over the course of a long season. It's very easy. So, well, you know, Steve, we did this, we did that. You know, like uh, so many people said, you know, Steve, you know, Landon Sims is a closer, and you forget the fact that he was a middle reliever for us the first month of the season. That was his role. And then when, when you know, Raleigh Self gets hurt and Spencer Price has some issues with control – and so all of a sudden, Landon Sims kind of evolves in our closure. You know, that was not the initial plan. It's kind of happened that way. This is a guy, too, that has Major League Baseball aspirations, and he's not going to stay at the closer level. He wants to – you just like Tanner Allen didn't stay at first base. I mean, sometimes you got to do what's best for the kid and give somebody else another opportunity. You know, Josh Hatcher also was a better defensive first baseman than TA, too. You, you, we have a revisionist history about that, but that's the reality of it because it's a bigger catch radius. Uh, so I'm working through that. It's been a lot of fun. I've uncovered some things too because I do my research. I try to do, you know, I write a good lead. Try to anyway to kind of leading into the series and kind of talk a little bit about you know, you know what's going on between the two schools and what the history of it's like and you know, some personality type stuff. You know, some things. You know, some personal asides that, have, that I've learned about players or coaches you know, about each series. You know, where there perhaps is a connection. And so it's been a lot of fun. Uh, so by the time we get together again, let me think here for a second. Yeah, by the time we get together again, I'll, I'll have, I have two more done. And so we'll have uh, eight chapters done. And so going to be, I guess, around 22, 23 chapters plus the uh, introduction, the preface, and the epilogue. And so there's a lot to read. There's a lot to write. There's a lot to feel good about. And, uh, of course, the new book is called Dogpile. And it, uh, if you liked Flim Flam, Stark Villains, or Alpha Dogs, you're going to like this one too because I wrote them. And I wrote this in exactly the same format. And uh, there's some pretty special interviews too that uh, they're going to be exclusive to the book that, uh, that you've never heard before uh, by some people that will share what winning the College World Series means to them. And these are people that are important to you. So I'm working through all that. I'm very excited about it. And I'll tell you too, it's one of those things where – I got a little burnout last week, you know, because like I've got to do all the jeans page stuff. I got to do the show and, uh, you know, got to be a parent. And there's, a lot, there's a lot that goes with that. And I wasn't getting a lot of rest. And so I took a day off and I went down uh, to Jackson on Sunday. I went and saw that great rock show at Howl Mouse. And uh, it kind of sharpened us all a little bit. So I got back and on Monday I rested a little bit because uh, I was out late, but I uh, rested on Monday and I uh, went right back to work. And, um, uh, you have written, you know, a couple chapters this week, and I'll knock out a couple more. I've already got the, the lead into the third one for the week, and I guess I'm on Kentucky now. I finished up Arkansas today. 
finished up LSU yesterday. And uh, the ride that Arkansas chapter is, uh, is not a lot of fun, right? But it's very educational. It's very educational. There's some things that were said and done during that series, I think, really kind of changed you know, the tra- trajectory of our season, even though we lost. And I think it really drew the players closer to each other because – and if I, again, if I step on your toes, I hope it hurts – because some of you turned your back on our baseball team. You know, I'm not going to make you hold your hand up or stand up in church and admit it, but there are many of you after the Arkansas series, you're like, ah, oh, this is it. You know, we're not any good. I told you guys then, you know what, we go through all this together and we begin to think, you know what, maybe this isn't our year, but it turns out it was our year. And along the way, you're going to lose some ball games you shouldn't, and you're going to learn a lot about your team. You're going to learn about their ability to be resilient. You're going to figure out how tough they are. That Arkansas series, even though we got swept, Mississippi State displayed some real fight in that series. Now, we got hit with some haymakers, and we could have quit, but we didn't. And we had some guys that uh, struggled in the bullpen in a couple ball games. But, you know, I go back to that Sunday game with Jackson Fristo. Jackson Fristo pitched well enough to win. We lose the ball game 6-4. to four. But Fristo was out there. He's a freshman under an incredible amount of pressure. You know, every time that Jackson Fristo took the mound, and we had won his four previous starts. You know, he didn't start at LSU, but he got tagged with the loss and relief of Eric Sarantola in a Sunday game because he gives up a solo home run. But we put him back on the hill against Arkansas. And, uh, listen, this is a lineup that had rocked uh, Christian McLeod and had gotten to Bednar a second time through the order. And they had rocked pretty much everybody. And then Frista goes out there and basically kind of makes some things happen, and we don't play defense behind him. You know, we had opportunities. And people forget, you know, that Saturday game was a 5-5 game. You know, we'd been punching them out till we clawed our way back into it. You know, so, again, even in defeat, we learned how tough our team was and how they weren't just going to lay down and be beaten. If you were going to beat Mississippi State, you were going to have to beat them because they weren't going to quit. And I think you could see that early in the season. You, know, you had a couple walk-offs you know, against Tulane, against Eastern Michigan. There were a couple times that we just kind of, you know, we didn't play well. We put ourselves in a situation where, you know, we, our backs were against the wall late in ball games against teams with inferior talent. But because of those situations where we were trying to find our identity – we learned that we were good enough to win it late. If we could just get it to the ninth, we got a chance to win the ball game. And I can't count how many times I've written some recap of a game where the game is all but decided in the ninth, and what do we do? We go out there and get a couple runners on, and you know, we tack on a run, or we load the bases, or you know, we didn't quit. And that's something that shows up over the long haul. You know, you start quitting on games in March, you won't play in June. You, know, you learn how to win in a non-conference. And you get into the conference part of your schedule and you begin to learn how good you are. And that Arkansas series is big for us. You know, none of our guys, with the exception of T.A. and Rowdy and Josh Hatcher, I guess, had never played in a big series. We never had. I mean, we'd gone down and we won at LSU, which was huge for us because that's such a rarity for us to be able to beat LSU. And I think maybe we came home thinking, you know what, we're, we're good enough. We're okay. We're good. We're at home. And listen, the last two times Arkansas came in here, we swept them. Uh, it's all good. And then they came in there and punched us right in the mouth. We had a couple of choices to make there. We could stand there and bleed and we could punch back. We did. We did punch back. We didn't knock them out. But I think we learned a little bit about ourselves. And that's, that's a veteran Arkansas team. That's an Arkansas team, too, that understood the importance of coming down here and taking a series to Mississippi State. They were trying to win a Southeastern Conference championship, and they knew that we were one of the teams in contention. So if they go down there and win a series against Mississippi State, it gives them a leg up on us, but also, too, it's a huge road series win over a contender. And they sweep us. So it was a worst-case scenario for us. But I think in the end, I think the lessons learned that weekend probably served us down the stretch. You know, if we win one of those games, we're co-champions of the SEC. That's, that's the difference. We lose the conference by two games. Don't forget that awful series against Missouri. 
and we gave a game away against South Carolina on a Sunday. We didn't play well against Vandy on a Sunday. So we had our opportunities. But what's remarkable to me is to go back and you know work through all this stuff and look at these old box scores and watch some of these games again. And you begin to realize that, you know, we didn't really know who we were in February, March, and, and maybe even into early April. We were still kind of getting a sense of ourselves, trying to settle our weekend rotation, trying to settle the defensive lineup. And, and all year long we kept hearing things like, I don't understand how we're so deep in the year and we're still tinkering with the lineup or we're still trying to figure out how to play defense. Well, that's what the season gets you ready for. The season prepares you for the postseason. And so you tinker then so you don't have to tinker later. And I think in hindsight, as you, as you kind of see these things kind of develop over time, you realize Chris Simonis knows what he's doing. Scott Foxhall knows what he's doing. I mean, if you had told me at the beginning of the year, hey, guys, listen, Eric Sarantola has been billed as one of the top players in the draft, but uh, he's going to get one SEC start this year. What kind of season do you think we'd have? And so, you know what, Steve, you guys aren't going to settle a Sunday starter really the whole year. You know, it's going to be a different guy. Like, you know, it was Sarantola for the month of March. It's Fristo for the month of April. And then we're going to kind of figure it out from there. And then all of a sudden, you know, May, it becomes Houston Harding. And so we, then we had a different Sunday guy, you know, what, three different times. He said, you know, Steve, you know, the very first weekend of the year, you're not even going to have two of your best three guys, but you're still going to go win two ball games against top ten opponents. How you feel about that? Well, I take it. It's just remarkable what this season became. But I think when you read the book and you have a chance to kind of sit, there's going to be so many things that jump out. You're like, oh, I remember this. I remember this. Oh, my gosh, yeah, this is when that happened. This is when things changed. This is when the defensive lineup settled. This is when our batting order became potent this is when our pitching staff kind of came together and it's been remarkable to see it and go back and relive all that and i can't wait for you guys to read it and again and as soon as we get everything settled you know we'll have that pre-order link up and available and again the book's not going to be out until uh, you know november december but uh, i'm working hard on it i'm working on it every single day and uh you know to the point sometimes too that uh, i got to get up and walk around a little bit you know i'll, I'll just i get settled in and i get excited about writing a chapter and then, uh, you know, sometimes when I feel like that maybe I'm pushing a little bit, I'll just stop and get up and walk outside, take my dogs outside and kind of enjoy the sun a little bit and kind of refocus and come back in and finish. But this is a labor of love for me because I love Mississippi State. And I love all of you. And I love the fact that we're national champions. Until next time, let's all live our lives in a way we'll make more friends than enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live. Your car doesn't get much of a summer break. Bugs, UV rays, and pollen can all cause damage. Stay protected at WetGo with WeatherShield and a free month of unlimited washes. Just purchase your first month of WetGo Go Unlimited and your second month is free. Wash as many times as you want. And when you choose our all-weather or showroom pass featuring WeatherShield, you'll say bye-bye to bugs all summer long. Sign up today at getgocafe.com slash unlimited. In the Smoky Mountains, it's not just about getting away. It's about getting together to zoom across a zip line, splash down at water parks, shop till you drop, and say hello to the statue of our hometown hero, Dolly Parton. This year, discover the thrill of visiting the Smokies and reconnect with those you love the most in Sevierville, Tennessee. Learn more. Visit Sevierville.com. That's visit S-E-V-I-E-R-B-I-L-L-E dot com.